what we're going to be talking about is the Messiah. And uh, we have talked so many times, you hear it all the time, about how Israel is over there and they're praying at that wailing wall, praying for the Messiah to come. And uh, so I've always assumed that who they're praying for is the God to come back. Or, and we've always criticized them, we've always kind of... Uh, look down our noses at him and says, how can you not understand that the Messiah came 2,000 years ago? He came, you rejected him, he's gone, and when he comes back the second time, everything's going to be a whole lot different. Until, it's about three weeks ago, I heard something, maybe you've seen it, uh, how many people seen with Morgan Freeman? You watch that thing, Who is God? Normally with that particular program, I don't really pay too much attention to, but there was a little statement in that, and I, I recorded it because I could not believe what I had heard. I had to rewind it, go forward, rewind. Re I couldn't believe it. So I'm actually going to play it. Is there a Messiah? In Judaism? In Judaism. Jews invented the Messiah. But it's not the same Messiah that most people think about. Okay. Because right? when Christians think of the Messiah, they think of someone who's divine. Yeah. They think of, you know, the end of days. What we have for the Messiah is a man, a king of this earth, who's going to bring peace among the nations in this world. And he will not be divine. He will not be divine. And Euron tells me this mortal Messiah has a very specific to-do list. According to Jewish tradition, he has three things he's supposed to do. Number one, he's going to reconstitute the Jewish kingdom or the Jewish state. Number two, he's going to bring peace with the neighbors. And number three, he's going to rebuild that rebuild temple. Rebuild the temple. Here we are. This is 2015. What are you going to do now? What is contemporary Jewish position on the temple? The Jews think of the world in terms of this dream that once existed in the world that was taken away the Jews want to bring back into the world. That is the reconstruction of the temple. The reconstruction of the temple as the, the, the crowning symbol of this era of justice and peace that we're supposed to be ass assisting to bring back into the world. They are, we have always assumed that they are looking for God to come back in the natural. And I never knew that they're not looking for that. And when I heard what the requirement was, I was like Sister Katie up there. She kind of looked and worded it to me. The Antichrist. It fits perfect. He, he fits perfect to what they're looking for. He, they're looking for someone who come on the scene, bring peace, who's able to rebuild that temple. And they're over there daily. Even today, they're over there at that Wayland Wall praying for the Messiah to come who's going to be a natural born human being and not divine in any way. And he is going to be a king of this earth. And when I heard that, I said, you've got to be kidding me. All these years, I thought they were looking for God to return. And not, that's not who they're looking for. They're praying for this man to show up who's going to be king. And what I thought was interesting is, is that they actually thought in 132 uh, CE, they actually thought the Messiah had come. And his name was, and I know I'm not going to say this correctly, uh, Bar Kaba. And in 132, he helped bring a revolt against the Romans. And he was able to, in his time, he was able to push back the Romans. He was able to defeat many of their strongholds. He was able to bring back uh, many of the cities and so forth and so on and bring them back into Jerusalem. They actually started reprinting uh, the mint and stuff like that and coins. And everything was going good. They, they had their... They had their uh, Messiah, they had this king, he was doing everything, he was going to set up the temple, and something happened. He ended up dying. They killed him. Romans came in and sacked the place and killed him. So then all these Jews who had just got done claiming that he was the Messiah turned around and said, oh, well, he wasn't the Messiah, really. We're really praying for somebody else. Well, of course. I mean, who, um, but here's the thing that I never understood, and I was thinking about it today. They're looking for this Messiah to show up who's going to be a king and be there, well, how long did he think he's going to last? Eventually, he's going to die if he's natural. And then what? Look for another king? Look for another Messiah? You know, Israel's always had a problem, and God has always had a problem with the Israel, all the way back to the days of, of Samuel, when they wanted a king like the rest of the world. 
They wanted this king, and they wanted to be. They didn't want Samuel. They didn't want the king of kings or the god of the Lord of lords. And they didn't want him. They wanted a natural born king. And for then on, they've been searching for this king, like Sal, King Saul and then David. Now, uh, some of the requirements of this uh, particular uh, Messiah that they're looking for is uh, they're looking for he has to. Uh, he has to be out of the root of David and so forth and so on. Well, everything that they're talking about, kind of mentioning, is Jesus Christ. He fit that as far as the scriptures go, but they don't recognize him as being the Messiah. So going into the scriptures here, I'm going to kind of talk about some of the passages and then kind of talk about going on a little bit further. But there's another uh, shocker here in a little while, maybe, and hopefully I can get to it. But in Acts chapter 1, we're just going to read a verse here and then go on. But it says the disciples, even when the disciples were uh, on the earth and they were talking and sitting down with the Lord, they knew that there was a Messiah that was to come. And they were searching for him. They were looking for him. They understood that the Messiah was supposed to show up. The Bible only mentions the word Messiah in two places. The word Messiah is only found in Daniel chapter 9. That's it. The word Messiah is... Is found only in, it's only found twice throughout the entire Bible, and it's found in the book of John in two different chapters, and I'll probably read all of them. But there, I was amazed at just how little information. I said, "Well, I'm going to study on the Messiah. There should be lots of scriptures that says the word Messiah in it. There's a lot of references to him, but the words Messiah or Messiah is only found four times in the Bible. But in in Acts chapter one verse six, it says this." It says, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he, said unto, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and the clouds received him out of their sight. So when he was taken up, he was gone forever. He, was, he tells them, they said, are you going to restore the kingdom? And he says, you don't know the times. It's not for you to know. But you're going to receive power. So he was trying to tell them there's something greater than restoring this natural-born kingdom. And over there in Jerusalem, and another passage there, I think it was, I might even read this, in Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> And you know the scripture that I'm going to probably go to. But in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 and 2, <clears throat> And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, and that shall not be thrown down. You look over there in Jerusalem today, you will not find one stone upon another stone in, on the temple mount of the original temple, or this temple that they were building. It was destroyed. In 70 AD, the Romans came in and accidentally burned the place down, according to one legend, a theory or story was told. And, uh, but it was destroyed. The order was given not to destroy the city or destroy the temple, but it ended up being destroyed. And, um, but... It's no longer there. You cannot find one stone upon another. And, and what's amazing, I've been watching some other programs. You know, the Inca, thousands, hundreds of years, their civilization has been gone, but yet you can find their cities, their walls upon mountain, you know, stone upon stone. Mountains have came back and the forest has taken them over. You can go back to the, the Egyptians. You'll find their places. Their stones are still upon each other. You go to the Mayans. You can go find their temples. You can go over there to China. There you can find the Great Wall of China. All these stones, but when it comes, to, when God says you won't find one stone upon another, yet it came true. It just seems almost impossible that God would. Here He said, here they have this temple already halfway built or already built, and yet He says there won't be one stone upon another. Now, what was the probability of that happening? Thousands of years later, it's not there, but yet you can go to these other cultures and you can find stone upon stones. You can find roads through the jungles or the, the Inca or the Mayans have put these different roads throughout. It's just amazing how God, he, he told them, says, but there's something, something more than that temple. Yeah. And that's what God was trying to get to these people. They don't understand that this is the temple now. They're still rebuilding that temple, looking to, for the day to rebuild that temple over there in Jerusalem. 
And they're, they're going to be highly upset when they find out that when that day comes, it's not going to be what they thought it was. In Isaiah chapter 1, I was reading on this yesterday and, and today and uh, trying to get the scriptures together. And, and like I said, I had this thought and, and uh, I've been thinking, I said, I just could not believe that they have been seeking and praying for a Messiah that's a natural born king or a human being. I mean, here they got the, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, but that's not who they want. They're still today re rejecting Him. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10 through 16 there, and I think I'm going to, and then I'll jump down to the chapter 2. But in verse 10, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Saith the Lord, I am full of your burnt offerings of rams, and the fat uh, of feed. Uh, I'm sorry, and the fat of fed beast, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or in the lambs, or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hands to tread my courts? Bring no more vain obligations. Incense is an abomination unto me. Your new moons and sabbaths, the calling of the assemblies, I cannot away with it or with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meetings. I, I was reading this, and I was thinking about over there in Jerusalem in that the Wailing Wall, and I wanted I wanted to ask myself that, or I asked myself this question. I said, "Who gave them the permission to go over there, or the commandment for them to go pray at the Wailing Wall? Where is that found in the scriptures that they are to go and pray at the Wailing Wall? Nowhere." It was only I looked this up to try to find out when did this actually start beginning. To, um, when did they actually start praying at the Wailing Wall? And there is a little bit here or there, something like the 2nd um, century, there's 3rd century, there was get bits and pieces that they were allowed to go and uh, pray on the Temple Mount. And then throughout time, after this revolt, uh, somewhere, it's been around about 135 CE, somewhere in there, maybe a little longer, they, they actually got the right to actually go back into Jerusalem and actually start praying, and they started praying at the Wailing Wall at that time. So here they are for all these years, have been praying for the Messiah to come, and they've been praying at that Wailing Wall for years. And, and Brother Randall has mentioned many times, there's actually worn into the wall where they have prayed at that thing for so long. Uh, I, they have, if you was to go there, and if you said you're going to go and say you're going to go and uh, pray at the thing, they actually have police. They're, they're called the modest police. police, And you can't even go there. There was a lady a few years ago. Uh, she was a transgender. And she was going to go pray. And they seen her. And they first rejected her and said that she cannot go and pray where the women go and pray. Then she says, well, I'm going to go and decided she was going to go pray at the, with the men. She got rejected and thrown out of there. She wasn't allowed to go to either one of them. And so they recognize that place as such a holy location and a holy place, but yet, who gave them the commandment to go pray there? They're just doing it because it represents the old city, the old where the Mount Temple Mount was used to be. They're not allowed to go on the top because it's where the Muslims are at. And uh, I did not know, according to this program, <clears throat> the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock is, is actually owned by the state of Israel. It's not owned by the Muslims. The state of Israel gave that location to them uh, so that they can do this, so they can have their mosque. But if they own it, if the, they can always take it if they want to. And they asked the question, well, how come you don't build the temple? And they made it very clear. The guy said, he says, well, the Jews ain't ready and the Muslims ain't ready. And they made a point of saying if they did, it would be an apocalypse uh, throughout the world if they was to do something with that temple mount, the Dome of the Rock. But, but here it goes on. Let me get back into this. It says, <clears throat> verse 15, it says, when, And when ye have spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. He's telling them once again to, to stop doing some of these vain obligations. They were so caught up in the old traditions, the old law, that they were not, under, not really getting the whole idea. It wasn't God never wanted the goats. He never wanted the, the bullocks. He never wanted all the blood of God. No, He wanted us. He wanted a living sacrifice. 
And when he came on the scene, thank God he changed that. And, but yet, still today, Israel is over there still today praying for this Messiah to come or this natural born or human being to show up who's going to be this king. In Isaiah chapter 2, starting with the first verse, going through the sixth verse. And, and there was a lot. I, I actually cut out a lot of this um, Bible, uh, these scriptures, because I knew I'd never get it done. And uh, even though I have all night, but I said, no, I better not. But in uh, Isaiah chapter 2, it says, the word, of the, Lord, or, so the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, uh, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord, Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, all, and all the nations shall flow unto it. And many people should go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God uh, of Jacob, and he will teach us the, his ways, and he will walk, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall uh, beat their uh, uh, swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall li not lift up sword against na nation, neither shall there be learn war any more. This is one of the prophecies that Israel is looking for today. This is one of the, the I'm sure there's many other scriptures that th they're talking about, but this is one of them, where they are hoping for this day to come. But as I was reading on this, it doesn't really, when I uh, put this with other scriptures, it doesn't um, mean what they think it means. You see, the Lord, they're looking for the temple to be built on this earth. The Lord's not going to build a temple on this one. They're not even looking, the Lord's not even promising in these scriptures that it's going to be here. The temple, they're looking for the day that they're going to build it. No, God's temple is going to be built, He's going to build it. In verse 5 there it says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they have re uh, replenished from the east and the soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased themselves in the children of strangers. They have gone away from the God's ways, his scriptures, his plan, gone away with, but yet they feel holy enough to be able to go back and rebuild his temple. It's not going to happen. In Revelations, and I'm not, um, as I was doing this, I, I don't know everything about this, and, and about the uh, Revelations in the Scriptures, but I, I, did, I was doing some research on this, and when it got into the prophecy part of it, and it's kind of funny, but I've always said that when I first got into the ministry, I thought, well, everyone had to know, understand, if you're a minister, you had to know Revelations. You had to understand every part of it, every deep mystery. You knew it all. Just, I just understood that that's what a minister was. And uh, it's kind of comical now, but I mean, I, for a year, I was killing myself trying to figure out the, the book of Revelations and everything else. And, and I had all these different books, and this guy was saying this, and that guy was saying that, and I literally was getting sick. And nowadays, as I was starting to do this now, it's just yesterday I was reading the scripture and talked about prophecy. I literally, that fast, started getting a headache. And I just went, okay, yeah, I know, Lord, I know, I understand. I'm not getting into this part. I do not want a headache. It is still this way today. But I've always said, if anybody is going to get the revelation of the end days and the end times, it's not going to be the world religions. It is not going to be somebody that doesn't even know who God is. Their, their, their philosophies and their ideas, if they don't know his name, they're not going to be able to do this. If they don't know the plan of salvation, they're not going to be able to have the revelation of all this. And so it's amazing to me that still today people go out to the world to try to get understanding on this. It's not going to happen. And I'm not saying I'm going to get it. If it happens, great. If not, thank God. But uh, whoever it comes, I believe they're going to have the knowledge that I believe is going to come to the church of Jesus Christ. There's just no other way that I can see. I'm not saying that one minister won't have a little piece of it, another minister might have another, another one I had that, or it might all come to one minister at one time. Who knows? I, I don't know how it would be, but, and we might not get any of it, and we might just live through it and see it all, but, and then we'll have the understanding later. But however God wants it, that's how it will it'll be. But in Revelation 21, verse 9 through 11, I wanted to bring this out because here they are, the Jews are looking for this temple to be rebuilt, They've got all the stuff for it. I think 
Uh, I seen a video, Sister Katie gave me a video of, of some of the things that they've got. I mean, they've got it all. They've got everything. They, all they need is the order to go up there and build that temple. And they've got the stones. They've got so much. The clothes, the priesthood. They've got the, all the, the gold, the, all of the, everything you can think of that was in that original temple. They've got it. They're ready to go. Uh, even the, the red bullock, they've got one. I, I remember I had, a, I had a clipping of one years ago. So they're ready to go. They just got to get that temple mount out, get that dome of the rock and get permission to do so. But if they did it today, it would be a huge war. But uh, in, in verse 9 there it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Now over there in Isaiah, I talked about they go up to the mountain. He took him to a high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So that lets me know and tells me it's not going to be built. Now some will say, well, this is all a dream and it was in, he was in the spirit, but... I believe this particular part, it was coming out of heaven. I believe there's going, to be, there's going to be the one, the Lord has his own temple that's ready, that's not defiled. Not going to be defiled by man's hands. It's going to be holy, it's going to be pure, it's going to be clean. And so here they have, here's one coming out of heaven upon this high mountain. And it goes on further, it says, Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a great wall and high and twelve gates, and the gates of the twelve angels, uh, uh, and names were written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes, and it goes on further and tells you all this. But it go, I just wanted to bring that out, part of it out, because here it is, they're talking about, they're looking to rebuild the temple, and the Lord has got one already prepared. He's going to come back, when He comes back, it's going to be a whole new He's going to rebuild, and everything's going to be changed. In Revelation chapter 11. He, they're looking forward to re be able to reestablish this new kingdom and reestablish to bring back the kingdom of David or the kingdom of Solomon. They want to bring back those glory days of the golden years, if you want to call it that. Bring those years back. But the Lord's like saying... I'm going to be able to build something and recreate some, or make something that's all new. The former is going to be passed away. New earth, new heaven, everything, all changed, new. But the world's still looking for something down here. Jerusalem's still praying for a Messiah down here. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, it says, and the, temple, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there uh, was seen in His temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and an inner earthquake and a great hail. I remember when I read the scripture, I remember a few, maybe a year or so ago, two years ago, I remembered I said, I found the, the, the ark of the covenant. I know exactly where it's at. I found it. It's right here. It's in heaven. Call, I, I remember call Indiana Jones, call him up, tell him, hey, here it is. Go get it. It might be hard to get there, but here it is. It's right there. It's not on this earth, but yet, I've seen documentaries and documentaries and they've gone on expeditions and different expeditions trying to find the, the, temp, uh, the, the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. They've thought it was under the Temple Mount. The, 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 the uh, different groups have gone in and tried to find this thing. Uh, Hitler tried to find it at one time. And there's just all these. But here, why don't you just look at the Scriptures and see what the Scripture says. It says, in his temple, the Ark of the Covenant is. Well, Brother John, now, how could it be in his temple? It's something man-made. Well, if he can translate two men and, and, and bring them up, I think he can bring up a, a piece of uh, the Ark of the Covenant and his testimonies. I think he can take, if he was taken up into heaven, I think he could take the Ark of the Testament also. But that's my theory, I mean, just based on this scripture. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 through 27. Now here's where you find the two scriptures that talks about the word Messiah in them. 
The only place in the Bible that says the only place in the Bible that says the word Messiah and spelled out that way, unless you have a different translation, and maybe in the New Testament it might say Messiah that way, but uh, mine refers to the Messiahs in the New Testament. But in verse 25 of chapter 9, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah... Until the commandment was given to rebuild and Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people and the prince that shall come uh, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be a, with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolation are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall come or cause the sanctifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading abominations he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. And that determination determined shall be poured upon the desolate. A lot of big words there. I mean, there's more than three letters in each one of those. But, you know, what it basically, this was where I actually, and I started reading this, I got my migraine here when I started going into this three and a half weeks and all this and that. And, and there's so many people get caught up in all of the three, three and a half. And, and I've always said this, as long as you're ready, it doesn't matter if God comes before, the middle, or the end. I don't, if you're ready and you've got the Holy Ghost and you're living where you're supposed to be, you, don't, you won't have to worry if God shows up tomorrow before the tribulation period, you won't have to worry if it happens to go halfway through the tribulation period. You won't have to worry if you make it all the way through the tribulation period. If you are ready and you're strong, you can make heaven your home. It's, it's ready for you. The Holy Ghost will guide you through it. I may not know what tomorrow holds, but we, Brother Troy always says we know who holds tomorrow. And that's a true statement. So here it is, the Messiah is here and here they are, the, the temple is going to be stopped. It's going to be showing that they're, so they're, the Jews are still praying for this Messiah to show up. The question is, is which Messiah are they looking for? They're looking for a king, natural born. Thank God we've got something better than that. In Isaiah chapter 8. Now, what about the real king, the real Messiah? What about him? And I, and I wanted to, I was going to write this in my notes. I said, will the real Messiah please stand up? And, you know, there's been so many different messiahs throughout, uh, throughout the time and throughout history. I didn't, I didn't get actually time to sit down and, and, and look it up. I, I remember there was a lot of false Christ uh, mentioned throughout the scripture or throughout history after Jesus Christ showed up on a scene. And if, even a few beforehand, Jesus Christ even said there's going to be false Christ that are going to show up. And, uh, but in Isaiah chapter 8, and I'm going to start with the 13th verse. And read through the rest of the chapter, then go into chapter uh, 9, because it's just so good. But, uh, but it talks about the, the real Messiah. What is he really? Here's the prophecy for him. But in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13, it says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him, or, I'm sorry, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Why not let him be the one you respect? Let him give, be the one you give honor to. Let the Lord be the one that you look upon and say, direct us, O king. Which way, which way you want us, we'll go that way. Let him be that one. Sanctify the Lord. Reverence him. But Israel's looking for a king. Or the Jews are. And he said, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling... And of a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now this person that he's talking about here, when he comes on, he's going to be a sanctuary, but he's going to be a stumbling block. What did Jesus Christ, did he fulfill that? Absolutely. He was the stumbling block. He, he was also the stone that the builders rejected, the scripture says. Verse 15, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among the, my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I 
and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwell in Mount Zion. And when he shall say unto you, Seek unto him that hath familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter, Shall not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead? Why is it that we are seeking? He's telling them, why are you seeking to the dead when you could be seeking for the living? Jesus Christ is not, I always say, God's not dead, he's alive. He's not a God of the dead, he's the God of the living. He's not in the grave. That, 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 that one guy that I just mentioned a little while ago, that Kabbal, uh, Simeon bar Kalab, something like that. He's, his grave's there, you can find it, but you cannot find the bones of Jesus Christ. Why? They're gone. He rose from the grave. He's after, after he rose from the grave, he was seen of many. He, he was walked upon the earth for many days. He showed many signs. He sat there and ate with them. He talked with them. Gave them d d directions on what they should do. But yet, people today, they can't re recognize Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. They don't want to accept that. And I, I just, why? Why it's so hard about that? I was going to watch, a, there was a couple... Um, when I did the research on make sure that that was actually true, that they're looking for a natural-born king, there's actually debates online that you can, I mean, they're older, you can tell whoever recorded it was recorded on old TVs but, or uh, old video cameras, but they actually have these debates with, a, with some from the Jew, Jew side and those of the Christian sect and, uh, sect, and they both get together and they have these big debates. And I wasn't about to sit there and watch these debates. I was like, no, I'm not going to go off to that, but... They're on, I didn't think it was that much of it. I'm thinking, I've always heard that I just thought they're, they're praying for God to come back. They're looking for a natural born king, the Messiah. It goes on further. It says, oh, we should be going not to the dead, the seeking for answer. We should go to the living. But verse 20 says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they don't speak according to these scriptures that we have, there is no light in them. They're false. They're not true. And they shall pass through it, hardly be stead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. So here they are. Not only are they looking for the dead to be able to give them answers, but when they became hungry and God starts bringing plagues against them and cursing or bring, uh, tries to correct them, they're going to curse God and look upward and, and, and curse Him once again. That's when they want to talk to God. Not when they're trying to get advice on what to do and how to live and stuff like that. If they need something, no, they don't pray to Him then. They wait till they're in trouble, then they're cursing God. Sounds like something today. No one even mentions Jesus Christ until they're cussing. Then they mention Jesus Christ like that. Rolls right off the tongue, smooth as all can get out. But let them speak... Let them pray or let them talk about... Oh, no, we can't. It's Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. In His name. Verse 22. It says, And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness and dimness of anguish. And they shall be driven to darkness. The Lord is going... If they won't listen to Him and listen to the Scriptures, He's going to drive them into darkness. They're going to run right into it. Verse chapter, uh, verse one there, verse nine, or chapter nine, verse one. And I love this passage of scripture. It says, "Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations." The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They, they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them had the light shine. When it talks about the Nephtali and the Zebulon, it talks about the northern on the other side of the Galilee. It's referring to the Gentile nation. Those people up there, they were not Jews. They were, uh, they were the Gentiles. Other nationalities, they, they, they hear it, but they were not called originally. They were a people who they uh, desired, but... They were, they were considered dogs, as the one lady was told. But here they, but they have seen the great light. They walked in darkness. But because they wanted to see the light, a great light shined upon them. Israel, God shined His light upon them, and they rather had the darkness. 
And it says, verse 3, it says, Thou hast multiplied the nations and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy of heart in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. What's it referring to is when they get something uh, according to their joy is not when they read the scriptures or hear the, the blessings of the Lord in their daily lives or they see something. They're not rejoicing that, that they have his presence with them on a daily basis. No, they're rejoicing because of the Lord blessed me with just $100 or $200. The Lord blessed me because of it. The, they're not blessing him for the right reasons. They're not blessing him because he is so great, because he is so wonderful, because he is just who he is. He gave us a plan of salvation. But they're not rejoicing over him. They're rejoicing only when he gives them something. Well, what am I going to get? They're not thankful. They're, they're like spoiled children. If you give them $100 each day, and $100 and $100 and $100, they're not going to know the value of $100. And then when you stop giving them that $100, they're going to get mad at you for it. Where's my $100? Well, they're not, why don't you do something? Why didn't you be thankful for when you had it? But it goes on further. Verse 4 says, For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor, as in the days of Midian. For every battle of war, warrior, of the warrior, is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But his, this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of an increase of his government shall and peace there shall be no end. Who is this referring to? There's only one person that this refers to is Jesus Christ. When he showed up, he fulfilled all of this. His name is wonderful. His name is, he is the counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. Israel's looking for the wrong person. They want peace, but they rejected him. They hung him on a cross. They want this everlasting government to stand and bring all this peace and rebuild it. And yet he had it all. And they rejected it all. And still today, they're looking for a natural born king. Praying for this man to show up on the scene to give them peace from all their neighbors. Well, there is going to be one. It's going to be the Antichrist. And when he shows up, He's going to bring in this peace with a covenant, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on with this. And they're going to rebuild this temple, and they're going to think everything's great until he sets himself up as the king, and then everything will go. Then they'll maybe open up their eyes, even though they'll have two witnesses out there prophesying for several years, telling them that it's wrong. And then when they die, they rejoice for several days. Until they resurrect and come back to life and God takes them back, then they're angry. But it goes on to different, that's all different prophecies and stuff like that. But here they are, they have the Prince of Peace and they kill him. It says on further, upon the throne of David, they're looking for this king out of the root of David. Here he is. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal, or henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And I love this passage, and I always want to stop and, and, and really bring this up. The zeal of the Lord. That means when that zeal is more than just uh, being dedicated. I remember teaching on that years ago. I'm dedicated to work, but I don't have a zeal for it. You know, being, having a zeal is about being excited about it. I mean, when they call you to work, man, you're already halfway there. I'm, when I'm there, I want to go home. My brother, me and Johnny back there was talking, and he says, give me my eight hours and get me out of here. I do not want to be there. But you know what? If you have a zeal, man, you'll be there every time they call. And man, like I said, they call you, you're already halfway there. Now I'm being there in just a minute. Yeah, because you have a zeal. I'm dedicated to take, taking out the trash, cutting the grass. I don't have a zeal for it. You, if, Wendy has to tell me all the time, well, are you going to take out the garbage? Yeah, <laughs> take it out there. I don't have a zeal for it. But remember now, the Lord, it says the zeal of the Lord was going to perform this. How did he bring this? Remember, when Jesus Christ came on the scene, he was born in the little manger. He came and, and he became, he filled, fulfilled as a little child. But look at what he did in the last three and a half years. 
right before he died even. He was a person that was beat. He was mocked, spit upon. He was whipped. He had a crown of thorns shoved in his head. He, was take, he had to carry his cross of Calvary's hill. He was rejected by his own people. They hung him on the cross of Calvary, killed him on there, put a spear in his side. And remember that the zeal of the Lord is going to do this. Why? Because the Lord understood that after that, there was something greater that was going to happen. He knew and understood that the plan of salvation was going to come through his death. We can be alive. We didn't have to go and crucify this in a natural sense. We don't have to. But through him, salvation can be brought. He was going to get victory over the grave. He was going to get victory over death. He came to this earth so that we could have a chance to be saved. He gave us an opportunity. Because in his zeal, he was excited about this. He wanted to, to be saved. He wanted people to hear about it. But yet, how many people today really get excited when they hear about the plan of salvation? How many people get excited when they hear about the, the, the name of Jesus Christ? Some people criticize this. Oh, all you people are is hung, hung up on the name. And I think somebody said, well, thank God we're hung up on at least something. <laughs> but you know what? Thank God we have, we have a revelation of his name. Thank God he gave us an opportunity. Yes, we get excited when we hear, hear how great he is, how precious he is. Thank God for the plan of salvation. Thank God when I, when I was thinking back last Sunday night, I was watching some of these, or two Sunday nights ago, I guess. I was watching some of these young people and they were praying and, and uh, you know, tears just come into my eyes because I was sitting there thinking to myself, how wonderful that is to see young people praying, especially these little ones. They're lifting up their hands and they're praising God and they're seeking for Him. They're seeking for the Holy Ghost. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. But yet today, don't, people don't get excited about that. They don't, I mean, I'm not saying you all, but I mean, the, the world out there. They think it's just something, well, it's just one person said not too long ago and I, 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 I tell you, I, I'm just going to, if I ever see this person again, <laughs> uh, I don't know. But anyways, he, he made a comment and says, well, I don't know if I got the Holy Ghost or not. He said, I might have just got, it might have just been, uh, got caught up in the emotions of it all. And they, there were some statements that was made about it and says, well, you didn't get the Holy Ghost, don't worry. Because if you thought you got caught up with the emotions of it all, you didn't get it. Because if you got it, you would know it wasn't just emotions that you got caught up in. It wasn't the beat of the drums. It wasn't the, the bass. It wasn't the, the music. It was the genuine Holy Ghost. If you got it, you wouldn't understand it. You'd be still walking in it. Amen. And yet he's not. But you know what? I, I, I just, it's one of those things that it hurts. But you know, it's one of those people that you want to just meet and take them out somewhere and say, What is wrong with you, boy? <laughs> but uh, anyways, but thank God he didn't get what I got. I can be going through the things that I've been going through, and I, I trust me, and I'm nowhere near for what people, other people go through. Nowhere close. I mean, nowhere. But I sit back and I think some people say, well, how in the world did you make it through this? How are you doing it? One day at a time. That's all I can say. One day at a time. The Lord's going to help me get through it. Tomorrow might be a better day. If it's not, I'm praying for the next day to be a better day. If it's not, I pray for the next day. Well, how can you keep? Well, it's just simple. One step at a time. I just try to keep going one day at a time, one day at a time, one day at a time. Well, it might get worse, but there's a better day coming. It's just around the corner. It's just a, if you the, also, the, hand, the Lord's handle, the, 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 it's on the hand. The, the Messiah is coming. He's coming soon. I don't know when. I don't know if I live a lifetime and he never comes. He's still coming soon. And I want to be ready when he shows up. If I failed him, Absolutely. If he, thank God he didn't show up in those days. I, want to, I don't want him to come when I'm not ready. But when I'm ready, I want to make sure he's, I, I want to, when he comes, I want to make sure I'm ready. And I want to make, do whatever I can to try to make sure I'm ready. And do we slip and fall? Sure. But thank God he's there to help pick us up. It's what you do when you fall that matters. Get yourself back up. Try again. Keep on going. The zeal of the Lord is going to perform this. Verse 8, it says, The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lightened upon Israel. And all the people shall know when Ephraim and in the inhabitants of Samaria that say in the pride of the stoutness of heart, The bricks are fallen down, but we will build with huge stones. The sycamores are cut down, 
but we will change them unto cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezin and against him and join his enemies together, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all of this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now remember, I, I, I taught this and I read, I read the scripture, I just had a, this passage. His arm is still stretched out. He's still trying to save people today. Even though the Israel is going to be consumed, they talked about the Philistines behind them and the Sumerians in front of them and the Syrians and talked about the resins and the resins to deal with the Syrians. And look over there in Israel today. There are, uh, Wendy had asked me the other day, she says, well, how come Israel doesn't go over there and attack? I said, well, Israel, I said, they don't have the ground forces to be able to go and invade another country. I said, but if you try to invade them, they've got the forces to stand and fight. They will defend their ground. They don't care about everything. You can burn the rest of the world down, but they're going to defend Israel. They've, got the, they, they've said that there's no other army that is prepared for war on a moment notice like Israel. They are number one, ready to fight at any given time, unlike any other country. Sad fact today, in America, we are not ready if we had to fight a war in a foreign country. Well, yes, yeah, sure, we're fighting some over in different places. But if they came here and attacked, we would be in so much trouble. We don't have the forces that we used to have. We don't have the, the military that we used to have. We don't have the, the, the weaponry that we used to have. And it's an absolute shame that we don't have those things. But we always have to say, thank God we got a God above us, as Bishop Smith says all the time. It says, for, furthermore, it says, uh, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people turneth not out or unto him that smiteth him, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off the, from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and the honorable, he is the head and the prophet that teaches lies. He is the, uh, uh, he is the tail. For the leaders of, the peop uh, of this people cause them to error, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither have uh, mercy on their fatherless and widows. For every one is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not, is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. His anger is still upon them, but yet his arm is stretched out still, still giving them a chance. Over there in Revelation, there was a passage of Scripture that talks about all the different uh, uh, plagues and seals were going to be broken and open up. And I remember teaching a, a, a lesson on this. And, this. and they said that all of these plagues were going to come upon Israel, the world. And all the different things were going to happen. The blood's going to be turned, and the water's going to be turned into blood, and the, all the different different things. That, and one of them was mentioned, talked about all the islands are all going to be moved. But in all of that, man will not repent of their evil ways, and they will not turn away from them. They were going to have all of these plagues poured out upon them, and not still turn from their wicked ways and repent, but rather blaspheme God. It's just human nature. Uh, you think, how in the world can you think, you know, all these plagues that are coming on, you would think someone will say, you know what, Lord, forgive us. Please forgive us for the things we've done. Help us change. Lord, let us change, turn away from these things. And as I'm just saying that, I'm thinking, there was old King Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, I'm sorry, not King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, he was one, but King Fa the Pharaoh. Over there when Moses... Here he was putting plagues out there in front of them and hardened his heart. The Lord hardened his heart. And he still, until he lost his own son, the firstborn of his own house, then he was allowed to let the children of Israel leave. But you know what? Is it going to take the firstborn to die for this world to wake up? Even that happens. They've already got a contingency plan. If there was a rapture and the God called us, uh, the, the church away tomorrow, they've got a contingency plan. They've already got it figured out. I mean, there's, I've heard different, different versions of it. One is aliens came and took them all away. Another one is that God took away all the bad people and left all the good people. Another one is going to be, uh, I was, there's a few of them. 
Actually, I just can't remember all, but there was those two. I, I really liked both. God took away all the bad people and left all the good people. And then aliens, I, that was the two I think of, but there's another one I know. But, and, but they've got these contingency plans already planned out. The U.S. government's got some. How are they going to handle this? They've got some. Go on further here. Verse 18, it says, For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour, devour and the briars and thorns, and shall kindle uh, in the thickets of the forest, and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. And he shall eat on the left hand, and, the, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm, Manasseh, Ephraim, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And they together shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Still, they'd be grabbing onto their own arms and eating those. And yet, they will not re re repent. And God's arm is still stretched out, trying to bring them back, trying to save them, trying to give them an opportunity. And they just will not refuse, or they just will refuse to do so. Isaiah chapter 53. Now remember, it says, The Lord, the arm of the Lord is stretched out still. During all of this, His arm is trying to save them, trying to bring them out, trying to pull them out, trying to get them the chance. They just don't want to grab. You know, you can only, a, a fireman can only do so much when he runs up to the fire and he goes in there and he says, here, grab my hand. If they're not willing to grab his hand, he can only do so much. He could try to bear hug him and get him out of there if he'd get close enough to him. But if he can't, what can he do? They don't want to be saved. They'd rather stay where they're at. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12 there. It says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord. Remember, it's stretched out still. Who's going to believe our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor communist. And when he shall see him, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that shall be desired of him. You know, that doesn't mean, I, I read this before, and I, and I always thought, well, that just means the Lord was ugly. And that's not what that meant. It, does, it just means that he's, there's nothing uh, special. He's not going to be on the DQ magazine. And he's going to be, I was waiting to see if anybody caught that, but I guess not. The, the GQ magazine? Okay. I was waiting for somebody to correct me on that. But, but anyways, he's not going to be so handsome, so great looking, that they're going to say, oh, wow, look at him. Isn't he just wonderful? But no... They're, he's just going to be, they're going to look around and he's just going to be ordinary. And they're, they're going to, that's what they're trying to, trying to say here. Here he is, he's not going to be coming on this great horse and people are going, wow, there's, there's this great... When he came, he came as, a, as a, just, a, just a little boy in a manger. He was just a carpenter's son. People that knew him just said, well, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't he just a carpenter boy? What do we, what, we, should, we should, why would we believe him? But it goes on further, and this is what they're talking about here. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as, we're, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he was born, uh, born our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. He, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. This is the guy. He says the arm is stretched out still. This Messiah that was coming. It's here. Here he is. It's showing you in the scriptures. Prophecy is saying he's coming. It's talking about Jesus Christ when he shows up. And yet the Jews said, this is Old Testament. They can't even say it's New Testament. Oh, we don't believe in the New Testament. We don't believe in the Old. You don't believe Isaiah? That's what you want to ask him. What not part of this do you not understand? This king that shows up on the scene later on in years that they think is going to show up, this Messiah, he's not going to fulfill these things. He can't. 
Jesus Christ is the only one that fulfilled these perfectly. It goes on further. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a, a lamb to slaughter, and a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus Christ did exactly that. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generations? People sit there and try to say that the generation Jesus Christ had was married and had a couple of chis, children and his bloodline, his bloodline, there, he did not get married and he did not have children. He did not have, they sit there and say, who's going who's to declare his generations? He didn't have one. Verse 9, it says, and he made his grave with the wicked. He, was, he, would, he died on a cross of Calvary, and on both sides of him, he had two sinners. They were both thieves on both sides of him. And with the rich in his death, he was born, or he was buried in a rich man's grave. So how? So who? Who else did this? Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul a offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days. And pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteousness serve, or my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with, a, with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Thank God the Messiah came 2,000 years ago. Thank God He came and He gave us a plan of salvation. He changed the old covenant and He gave us an opportunity. Thank God, and I hate to say this, but thank God the Jews rejected Him. Because when they rejected Him, it opened up an opportunity for us to be saved. Now, I, I, I don't want to ever sit back and, and take this opportunity and, and sit back and say, well, you know what, and just waste it. I don't want to just live around, the, the, you know, some people that... Um, years ago when I was growing up, there was always, you know, I've been born around, I mean, since I was 12, I've been coming here. And Sister Katie's been born and raised here. Mark was pretty much born and raised here. I mean, he was a little, was, how old was he? Seven. So I know they, but still, been around here all their lives. And we always say, don't go out in the world to get a testimony. Live in the church and be the testimony. Right. And ever since, that was something I used to hear when I was a kid all the time. Don't go out in the world to be, get a testimony. Live here, stay in here. The twins back there, they've been born and raised around here all their lives. So, you know what? They, don't go out there and get one. Stay here. Get, be the testimony. But the world and so many people, we've got to go out there and get our testimony. No, you don't. You can be a, This is the stronger testimony. And I still thank God to see these children when they come up and get prayed. I'm looking for great things out of them. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to push them into it, but you know what? I, I, I want to see great things come out of them. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen, but... I believe there's for a reason. I don't believe it's done for no reason at all. Now, let's get over there in John chapter 1. And I'll try to hurry up here. My goodness. John chapter 1. And I'll try to hurry through this. Man. We'll start with the 29th verse. And read through the 41st one. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. This is he whom I have said after he or after me cometh a man which a, is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I was I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with the water, and the same said he unto me, 
upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist recognized the Messiah when he showed up. He seen him, recognized him, realized who it was, and said right instantly, this is the Lamb of God. This is the one that Isaiah prophesied about, the one that was going to be stricken, the one that the, the, the arm that was stretched out still. He, this is the one that he recognized Jesus Christ for who he was. Verse 35, and again the next day after John stood, the two disciples and looked upon Jesus, and he walked, and he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and said, or saw them following, and said, or saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, be interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the, the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speaking or speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah or Messiahs, which in this particular my it says Messiah there also, but in the other other uh, translation says Messiah. So depending on which translation of the scriptures you got, you got Messiah or Messiahs, which is the same which is being interpreted Christ. They recognized him, and they ran and told him. Simon told his brother, says, we have found the Messiah. Here he is, come and follow. And he brought unto him, and brought him to Jesus, and Jesus beheld him and said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is being interpreted a stone. I'm talking about Peter here. Jump over to uh, verse, I'm sorry, John, John chapter 4, verse 20. And I know I'm jumping in the middle of this particular passage, but it talks about the Samaritan woman. And we know the story with her, and, and the, he sits at the well, and Brother Randall's preached many times, and, and I think it was Bishop Lee taught, or someone taught about the well upon the well, and Brother Randall, I've heard Brother Randall preach about it many times. But he was much more there, and, but he starts talking to the Samaritan one, which is strange in the first place because the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. But in verse 20, reading down through the 26th verse there, it says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what, we worship, or we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto Him, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When He is come, He will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Jesus Christ, there's been so many people that says, well, Jesus Christ never claimed that he was the Messiah, never claimed that he was the Christ. He never claimed. Jesus Christ claimed, told the, the Samaritan woman, he that speaketh unto thee, I am he. So there shouldn't be any doubt about who is the Messiah. There shouldn't be any doubt There's, when he was taken away in the clouds and they said they were so uh they were so upset when he went, went away and they said why stand here gazing as you've seen him go away so shall he come back there is no one else that's going to be coming on the scene there we're looking for the right messiah we're not looking for a natural born king now here's something that's really sad and uh i did some research on this and i, I thought it was just it's amazing the Jews are over there, and they are praying for a natural-born king to show up on the earth who's going to bring all this peace. We are sitting there saying we're looking for Jesus Christ to show up. Do you know another group that's looking for Jesus Christ to show up on the scene? You hear them every night on the TV. Islam. The Muslims. In their teachings, they teach that Jesus Christ is going to show up in the last days and they have what's called a Madah, and I know I'm not saying that right, 
but he is called their guided one. And in the last days, Jesus Christ is going to show up on this. He's going to return. And with Madah, they're going to go out and they are going to defeat the false Messiah or Antichrist. And they're going to join the union and join the, the religions. And they're going to be able to bring this peace into the world. And they're, everyone's going to pray unto Allah. That's what they teach in their teachings. It's amazing to me that the Muslims in the Quran, they are teaching and looking for Jesus Christ to show up on the scene. But yet the Jews, his own people, they're not looking for him. Don't even recognize him as being a Messiah. Don't even want to take the time, even though he walked in their streets and healed them. But here you have the Muslims over there. They're even killing the Christians, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. They're over there killing them, beheading them, and all this stuff. And yet one day, Jesus Christ, according to their teachings, is going to show up on the scene and, and help them defeat evil. How is it? Why is it that Israel... No wonder God's so upset with Israel. No wonder he gets so frustrated with his own people. No wonder he turned his back on them and gave, them, gave us an opportunity. Because they refused him, rejected him. And when I heard, like I said, I, I don't know if it dumbfounded you, but it dumbfounded me when I heard that they're not looking, that, that the Messiah that they're praying for at that wailing wall is not divine in any way. I just couldn't, un, I couldn't believe it. I said, all these years, I thought they were actually praying for the Messiah, and here he's come 2,000 years ago. Just didn't realize they were praying for a king. They're still seek, seeking after that natural born king years ago. And that's still today going on over there in Israel. So I hope you enjoy.